The Owine Bupinge Rehabilitation Project is a project that is rehabilitating 30 homes in the Pueblo core area of Okeawinge. What was happening to the Pueblo is slowly it was deteriorating and to some extent dying. Even though it's a place that we still practice our culture, you know, with the dances, the ceremonies, that kind of thing, but the actual living aspect was dying. The one thing that this project is doing is bringing that back to life, where people are gonna live there once again. The project started uh, approximately um, 2005. It started by a conversation of discussing the possibility of um, rehabbing the Pueblo core area. We presented the idea to the board. They were supportive. Um, the next was tribal council. They were supportive as well. Except they um, thought you were crazy. Yeah, there's a couple <laughs> that felt like, you know, this is an impossible project. It could never be done. I was dreaming. One of the first things that Tomasita said as we were beginning the project was that this has to be of Oke Oinge. This, is ha this has to be of this community. This is the first time that the housing authority had developed anything on their own. And so that, I mean, I really took that charge personally and wanted to make sure that this, the Sigo Bugay Village project was of Oke Oinge. One of the other things that Tomasita said was that she wanted this project to show that the world of Okewinge can be a better place for her two sons, you know? And so for me as an architect coming into it, it doesn't get any better than that kind of commitment. I mean, it's rare to have a client relationship where there's this level of passion and this level of dedication and commitment. We did a whole preservation planning effort that included a cultural advisory team and we had tribal elders and leaders really talking to us about their goals for preservation. By creating the what we call UCAT, the Okewinge cultural team, they are comprised of spiritual leaders from the Pueblo who help us address the cultural issues. So, you know, for example, if um, there's any type of artifacts that are discovered in the ground, um, the cultural team comes in and addresses that. There's a process. Where does the vision actually come from for a community? I hope it doesn't come from a tribal leader only. That it has to come from the members of that community. And if we continue our, our approach, um, the community members will have always input, especially our younger one. This is the Pueblo at its most kind of intact state. But after this point, it's really in a state of deterioration. But we can't put it back to this. We're not going to make people go up ladders and crawl into a hatch and not have a toilet and not have a kitchen. So it's an incredible balancing act. Um, we're wanting to put back a lot of the qualities that we see in these early photographs um, while providing contemporary life. Uh, the Pueblo Okewinge has been here, as far as I'm concerned, uh, forever. And um, through generations and, and countless centuries, the, uh, the buildings have, have evolved. Uh, families have grown, additions have been made, doors and windows have been changed around. Um, the mud plaster and the adobes are, are a traditional part of how this place was built and how it was maintained for centuries. And the mud plaster, to highlight that, is, is an integral part of that lifestyle. I always refer to adobe and, and, the, and the mud plaster as, as the original green. You hear a lot about green building. And uh, as far as sustainability, it doesn't get much greener than this. We know. Um, as architects and, and doing a lot of research on, on materials that with an adobe building, 
uh, to put cement stucco on an adobe building is, is it doesn't allow it to breathe and it never bonds. And so a lot of the deterioration issues that we were seeing were that you know, when the stucco went on 20, 30, 40 years ago and people thought that's, a, that's the last time we won't have to do anything more because mm -hmm. it's a great new product. Um, now what we see is that if there's ever any cracks, you never see the deterioration because it's just happening within the water never leaves and that adobe just turns to, to dirt again. And, and so in a lot of situations, we had a shell of a wall because the, the stucco had encased the adobe. And, and that was sort of a really big leap for the cultural advisory team, for the housing authority, for us to, to talk about how do we address this? What is sustainable for these buildings? And we ended up with a hybrid so that the, it's protected from the, the elements with a metal cap, which is not traditional, but we are putting mud plaster back on. This used to be my grandfather's house and it's been here for years. I'm content at this house. I'm happy with what we have and I always will be. I'm hoping to give it to my kids and I hope they keep it up. Like, like I said, uh, like they used to tell us, a home is like a person. You take care of it, it takes care of you. My grandfather used to tell us that, but if you don't take care of it, they come back for it. The true meaning of the word Pueblo is a community. And if, if you're not doing, if you're not engaging the community and, and doing the restoration project that we're doing is actually reinvigorating the community and bringing people back to the historic core. And, and to me, that's really the basis of Pueblo, is having people involved again. My realm as a builder, usually we look at a wall as a wall. If it's stable or structurally sound, great. If not, we tear it down and rebuild. And through this process of historical preservation work, we've come to understand that each adobe is a historic artifact. And then you can take that a step further and say each of those, you know, our ancestors' breaths went into this work. It was incredible to understand how a person and a family and a building aren't separate entities in a place. Mm -hmm. They're all connected. And, and really when they start talking about the place that they're living in as being part of their their direct ancestry, not the home that their ancestors lived in, but part of their ancestry. It was amazing. Jenny was one of the project clients, and at first she wasn't really quite sure about the project and what we were up to, and then she came to one of our mud plaster trainings where they were learning the traditional practice of, of the mud applied plasters, and she remembered helping her grandma do it, and I think it just sparked something for her and we used to do it by hand when we were little. And later on, I told my husband I wanted to find out to see if I can get in with that crew. At first, we were a little bit hesitant. You know, it's hard work. It's, it's all day in the hot sun. But she jumped in there, and, and she made some of those guys look bad. I mean, she was an awesome worker and started applying the mud by hand, the old traditional ways, and just became an integral part of the mud plastering crew. I enjoyed it. It was fun, but a lot of work. <laughs> it's very much a, a, a living Pueblo, um, watching all the different generations and in, uh, in, in physically experiencing the work that we've done on the homes where when you take off the plaster, you see this evolution of building episodes that represents um, centuries. To me personally, the, um, the relationship aspect of architecture is absolutely critical. It's, it's, it's foundational. And I realize that not every um, architect or architecture firm approaches uh, projects in that way. But just personally, that, has, that is where I, has, I have found the most fulfillment in my practice. And, and so it's something that um, I think that my relationship with, with Thomas Sita and and OK Winge has provided that foundation for me to understand what's possible. And I do look for that in other projects. And I, and I do look for that um, relationship aspect to almost 
you know, all of my work. Her passion and her commitment um, to Okia Winge, not just in this particular project, but from the moment she started working here, has been, you know, acknowledged and accepted. And so that alone to me, we to some extent, there, there's some form of love there that, um, you know, the tribe has and Jamie has. We don't talk about love in architecture necessarily, but more importantly, we don't talk about the spirit and we don't talk about culture. You know, th these are the things that, at least for certain architects, are paramount, but they're very hard to discuss. Um, you know, there's, you know, you, you can't theorize very clearly or articulate very clearly what's important about spiritual values in architecture. But absolutely, that's what drives most of us. And, and so it, it is sort of this underlying thing that it would be wonderful, ha wonderful to have more ability to articulate more often. It's been a remarkable experience. Um, a lot of people have looked at the work we're doing at OK Winge and, and said, this is exactly how these pueblos should be saved. And that's not at all the message we want to send. Um, the way in which we've done this is, comes completely out of their value system and that's not replicable. Now it feels good because people are coming back. You hear kids running around and neighbors, you know, talking with each other and stuff. And before there was hardly anybody. Now everybody's trying to get along with each other again and hopefully there'll be more people in the Pueblo again. It's taken so much time, commitment, energy to make it happen. But it has, and it's happening right now. And so when I walk through the Pueblo, especially doing our dances, God, the feeling is just unbelievably amazing to walk through and see the families living in their homes again and knowing that they'll be able to live there for another, hopefully, 400 years from now, just like our ancestors did. Thank you.